Hey everybody, uh, so now that Ionic 4 is officially out, uh, I just wanted to do a quick kind of recap video uh, covering the key changes uh, that you'll find in Ionic 4. So I'm not intending this to be a kind of migration guide or anything like that. Uh, there's a lot of sort of small things that have changed uh, in Ionic 4. Uh, a lot of the stuff is mostly the same. So I just want to focus on the, what I think are probably the two big things that have changed and just give you a quick recap of what exactly is different uh, between Ionic 3 and Ionic 4. Uh, so to give you just a quick broad overview of what Ionic 4 is all about, if you haven't really been following that, uh, following that up until this point, uh, the main idea is that it now uses web components, which makes it uh, a lot more flexible. So rather than having Ionic's components being tied to Angular, they're now just generic web components that can be used uh, just by themselves in just a normal website, or you can use them with uh, any framework at all. You could use them with Angular still, or you could use Vue or React. Uh, right now, Ionic still has better support, I guess, for Angular specifically, because they have the uh, Ionic Angular package, uh, but they are currently working on support for Vue, and uh, eventually React will be supported as well. Uh, but you can just straight up just use the web components wherever you like uh, already. Uh, it's just a matter of Ionic actually having those specific packages to, to help you out a little bit. Uh, you'll see performance improvements as the uh, components have been uh, improved. And there's a lot of like little things that have changed, uh, just syntax things mostly. And then there's a couple of big changes uh, specifically related to uh, styling and uh, navigation. And just to give you a quick sort of look at the kinds of things that have changed, I've got the uh, the breaking changes document uh, open here. And if you sort of just scroll through this, at least all the changes that have been made from Ionic 3 to Ionic 4. And for the most part, you'll just see a lot of uh, little things that have changed. Uh, so a lot of syntax stuff like this, you can see now uh, they have an old usage, uh, usage example here of ion navbar that no longer exists. So you should use the ion toolbar instead. Uh, there's some markup changes like changing uh, buttons from this uh, using just a generic uh, HTML button to a specific ion button uh, component from Ionic. Uh, we have some changed properties. Instead of using icon left and icon start, you'd now use a slot equals start. And you'll see that a lot uh, throughout all the changes that slot is used a lot now. And slot is basically as a way to uh, inject content into specific areas uh, in a web component. So it's kind of similar to ng content, uh, content projection, if you're familiar with that. And so yeah, so I just recommend to scroll through here, have a look at the sort of changes. And as I was saying, a lot of it is just this small stuff where you're just changing something from, uh, you know, something like this, Ionic Angular to a new package name or changing a button from button to ion button, uh, small stuff like that. Uh, but as well as the uh, small sort of changes, there are a couple of big things as well. And one of the big things that have changed is how we style the applications now. And so the two big changes here are the use of Shadow DOM and the use of CSS variables. And so I'm gonna talk more about Shadow DOM in just a second. Uh, CSS variables are Basically, uh, they basically replace what we were using SAS to do before. So in Ionic 3, we'd have SAS variables to change things like the primary or secondary colors. Uh, they were just basically you know, a little variable uh, preceded by a dollar sign that we could add to the variables.scss file or any scss file in the application. And so now we're using CSS variables. Uh, you can still use SAS in Ionic projects, by the way. Uh, SAS is still used, uh, but for the variables, we're using CSS variables, which, uh, which are just natively uh, supported uh, in CSS. So instead of using something like uh, the dollar sign preceded by the variable name or followed by the variable name, we now use uh, a format that looks like this, with the dash dash ion background color. Uh, you'll find things like dash dash ion uh, color primary and things like that. Uh, but they're mostly used in the same way that the SAS variables were. Uh, but as well as just being used to configure simple variables, they are also used and they do play an important role in uh, the Shadow DOM. Now the Shadow DOM can be a bit of a tricky one to uh, explain and get your head around initially. 
Uh, so I want to just give this quick example here of what happens when we uh, use an ionic component. So uh, if we use an ion item, for example, we would write something like this, this ion item, and then we'd put whatever content we want in that item inside of that. Uh, but of course the ion item is a component that ionic is built and there's a lot more to it uh, than just being a simple like div tag or something like that. It actually does something. So this is what is actually added to uh, the document object model uh, of our website when we actually use ion item. So if I write this, this is what's getting injected into the DOM. And you can see we have ion item and we've got our hello there paragraph tag as well. Uh, but as well as all of that, we've got this div class equals native, got some slots there, an item inner, an input wrapper. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of stuff in there. Now the basic idea behind the shadow DOM is that it creates this kind of separate DOM that is protected from interference from the rest of the application. So in the case of uh, this ion item here, everything that's inside of this ion item would be in its own shadow DOM. And not every component uses shadow DOM in Ionic, but the ones that do will have everything inside of this ion item here protected. And so what that means is that if we, for example, uh, in Ionic 3, if you're looking through the, um, the source for the application and you wanted to do some specific styling, you could see perhaps that this item inner was doing something that you wanted to change. So all you'd have to do is create a CSS selector to target item inner, and you could just modify uh, the styles as you please. Uh, with Shadow DOM in Ionic 4, it doesn't work like that. If you try to target item inner or item native uh, or anything inside of this iron item and you tried to style it, it wouldn't work. The only way to style these things is to use these uh, CSS variables. So Ionic will expose variables for the things that can be changed and you can supply those variables to uh, make those changes to things inside of a shadow DOM. The only things we can target directly uh, when uh, working with a shadow DOM is we can still uh, target the ion item itself. Uh, so if we wanted to apply some style to that, if we want to add margin or padding or whatever uh, to the ion item, we can do that. And we can also still target the things that we add. So uh, if I wanted to target this hello there, uh, paragraph tag, I could still target that and the styles would apply without me needing to use CSS variables. So basically anything we're projecting inside of the component. Uh, so here, since I'm adding hello there to the ion item, I'm projecting that content inside of this slot here. So I'm still allowed to access that. It's not protected by uh, the shadow DOM. Uh, so this is a confusing concept, I think. And um, I, think it requires a bit more explanation than I'm giving here. So I do have, uh, I have an article and I have a video going through an example, uh, which I'll link in the description. So if you're not familiar with how this works, I definitely recommend checking that out. And I think a lot of people are probably um, maybe confused by this change as to why Ionic would go with this approach uh, because you know it is less flexible. You can't just access whatever you want now, whereas before you could, and maybe that seems a bit easier uh, I think it basically just comes down to uh, flexibility versus maintainability. So it might be a little bit more difficult, at least initially, to figure out how to modify these components now. Uh, but the plus side of this is that the Ionic components can only be modified in a kind of way that uh, Ionic is expecting. Uh, so what that means is that in the future, if they want to update these components, they can do that without breaking people's existing applications. Uh, if you're coming in here and sort of modifying things, you probably shouldn't really be modifying. If Ionic updates that in the future, then you know it's probably going to break some things. So uh, using this Shadow DOM approach is better for a sort of long-term uh, maintain a maintainability aspect. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be one of those things where if you're updating your application and you are sort of making heavy use of uh, modifying these internal styles of components, uh, you're probably going to have a little bit of a hard time trying to uh, migrate your application over. Okay, so the next big thing uh, that has changed is uh, navigation. And so the big thing now is that uh, Ionic is using the Angular style navigation instead. It's just using Angular's own uh, routing, which is URL based to perform navigation. And now this is only because I'm talking specifically about Ionic Angular applications. 
uh, in general, you would uh, now just use whatever navigation approach the underlying framework that you're using uh, uses. So if you're using Vue, you would uh, most likely use Vue's uh, routing system, or if you're using React, you'd use theirs. And so the big difference now with Ionic and Angular is that we don't have this uh, navigation stack that Ionic provides anymore. Uh, before we would push and pop uh, pages onto a, a navigation stack, uh, whereas now basically everything revolves around just changing the URL. So basically we would set up a, a bunch of routes in our application. We'd say that uh, the you know, forward slash detail path belongs to this component and uh, forward slash something else belongs to some other component. And whatever path is in the URL, that is what is going to control what is displayed on the page at the time. And so if you're not familiar with the Angular uh, approach to routing, uh, I don't think it would take too long to get familiar with it because most of it is done automatically anyway. Uh, when you create pages in uh, using the Ionic generate commands, uh, it automatically fills in uh, those, uh, setting up those routes for you. So the only time you really need to mess with the routes is if you want to do a more complicated route, perhaps where you're passing in an ID through the URL or something like that. And so the sort of downside of this that people will probably find is that uh, we don't have the NavParams API to use with Angular routing. So uh, before in Ionic 3, we could sort of pass these objects between pages using NavParams. Uh, whereas now the only way to pass uh, data between pages is through the URL. So uh, that isn't, you can't really use the URL to pass complex data uh, from one page to another. You could maybe pass an ID or something like that you don't want to pass entire objects uh, through a URL. Uh, so instead, now we need to do something else to get that data from one page to the other. So you could do something. We are creating a service, for example, if you want to uh, do a typical master detail sort of pattern, you could pass just the ID of whatever uh, object you want to display on the details page. You'd pass that ID through the URL, and then you'd look up that ID through some service to grab the rest of the data you need. Uh, so I think that's another one of those things that you know, it's changed a little bit and people uh, were a bit confused by it. Um, so the Angular approach to routing is good for PWAs. We ha now have these sort of nice URLs. Uh, so if you are building a PWA, you can you know sort of use more typical looking website URL navigation rather than having uh, the sort of hash routing in the URL and stuff like that. And you can easily just navigate to any particular page without having to worry about what's going on. Uh, with the navigation stack. So let's just take a look at a couple of quick examples of how navigation works in Ionic 4. So uh, if we want to navigate, just do a simple navigation from uh, one of our templates, all we need to do is add this router link uh, attribute here and you just link it to whatever uh, path you want to go to. As I mentioned, you set up some uh, routes in your application and certain paths will lead to you know, particular components. So if we we're going to the detail page, we could just say router link equals forward slash detail. And then when someone clicks on this button, that's just gonna take them to that uh, page. And you can also supply a router direction. We should supply a router direction to any navigations as well. Uh, since we don't have this concept of sort of pushing and popping anymore, uh, and it's all just based on URL routing, uh, there's not really, I guess, a sense of direction. So if someone's clicking on this button to navigate, uh, the so a router doesn't intuitively know if that's a forward navigation or if that's a backward navigation. And since Ionic's animating screen transitions, uh, it's important to know if it's forward or backward so it can animate that correctly. And so router direction, uh, that basically just allows us to tell the router uh, what kind of animation it should be applying. And so you could set this to forward, backward, uh, or root. Uh, if we want to navigate from our classes, then we still use the nav controller. And this might be a bit confusing too, because you know, we previously used nav controller, um, but the methods in the nav controller have changed now. Uh, and it's actually using angular routing uh, under the hood. So you can just use uh, angular routing directly, you can import from uh, you know, angular's own router. Uh, but by using the nav controller instead, uh, it handles um, that sort of giving the transitions a, uh, a direction. So it basically just does the exact same thing underneath the Ionic nav controller will just call angular routing, except it's also supplying that direction.
And so what we can do is just set up that nav controller and then just call one of its methods like navigate forward and then supply the route we want to go to. And so you can use navigate forward and navigate backward or navigate root. So I think those are the sort of two key changes, styling and navigation. Uh, mostly everything else is, uh, you know, it's mostly the same. Uh, There's just few changes, few syntax changes, stuff like that. Uh, depending on how complex your application is, of course it could, you know, you could have a really easy migration experience from Ionic 3 to Ionic 4, or it might, you know, also take a bit of time if you are sort of relying heavily on styling the internals of Ionic's components, or you have a more complicated navigation setup. Uh, but overall, it is it is quite similar to Ionic 3. And so if you would like a more sort of thorough introduction to Ionic, um, my book is being completely updated for the stable release of Ionic 4 now. Uh, so I'll have a link to that in the description if you'd like to check that out. And there is also a bunch of other resources you can check out, which I'll link to all of these in the description uh, as well. Uh, there is an official migration guide from Ionic, which runs through the changes you'll need to make to migrate an Ionic 3 application to Ionic 4. Uh, there is the official version 4 documentation now, which is the, the default documentation, which covers, uh, of course, all of the components and whatnot and how to use those. Uh, the breaking changes document is another important one, which uh, that was the document I scrolled through just before with a list of all the breaking changes. And I also have an article on my own website uh, where kind of compiled all of the Ionic 4 articles that I've been writing into a migration uh, guide of my own. So uh, you can check that out as well if you'd like. Okay, so I hope you liked this video. Uh, I hope it cleared up some confusion for some people. Uh, if you do still have any uh, questions or uh, concerns, feel free to uh, leave a comment. Uh, but otherwise, I will see you in the next video.